As if they don't have too much on their plate. The Kings of Combat Sports Podcast, John and Wade. They'll talk about the things they did that day. They'll analyze the work of Vince and Triple H. If you were Smackdown. 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 It is Review of Smackdown. I am John Pollock, along with Wei Ting, back again for some more wrestling discussion. What else would we talk about, Wei? Nothing. Nothing. No, not not a thing. Mm-mm. Boy, you really uh, caught me off guard yesterday with that Carrie Fisher news. I mean, how sad. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, wow, well, yeah. yeah I, I just happened to read it during the show, so. Sucks. As most, uh, yeah, may have heard. Mm-hmm. So anyway, I'm planning to go see that movie this week. I'm wondering if there, people are going to be very sentimental this week and be going to see this movie, even though, well, I guess I should not. I already know certain things about this movie that I will not get into for God knows no, you Star already, Wars. You already have. Well, whatever. Anyway, let's move on from uh, Star I Wars. Think, I mean, I do think a lot of people will be. Definitely. I Star think, Wars. Yes. Yeah. And as is kind of the case whenever there is a major death and someone's in a or possibly in a forthcoming movie. I mean, it's going to be even bigger now when that next Star Wars movie comes out, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, then let's move on from sad news and let's move on to Smackdown. Mm -hmm. What a night in Chicago. Night number two in Chicago. After watching all of this way, I, I watched SmackDown on Tuesday night, and then afterwards I I watched 205 Live, and I clicked on it, I watched it on the network, and up came 55 minutes, and I just, I looked at the ceiling, I was like, oh, am I going to do this? Am I going to watch this? And I ended up getting through it, and at the end of it, there was nothing, there was nothing in my body that could possibly make me want to continue and watch Talking Smack right after. Oh, okay. So you didn't watch it. I, I I did watch Talking Smack, but I did it this morning. But it was a real revelation that I feel 205 Live would be so much better suited for either Wednesday or Thursday night even on the network. Yeah, I, I, th- I, think, that's I think it would actually help them if there was some hot match and you hear from people in the arena raving about a match and you have a day or two to anticipate it and have a reason to tune in. Because the idea that we're going to shoot angles on Monday for Tuesday, very little. To me, there's very little that they do to set up. And then they have this awful 20-second promo to end SmackDown that is just the worst to send people to 205 Live. And it's just – it. I I hit a wall on Tuesdays, and I really like the two-hour SmackDown followed by Talking Smack. I thought that was like a perfect formula. And 205 Live – even with a name like that airing the next day, I just think it would be so much better. Do a two-hour block with NXT. Give it its own night on Thursday. I don't care. But I just think on Tuesday, there's no reason to have to put this on on Tuesday nights. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of people would agree with you and probably have been since this whole thing was announced. I feel like the only people that are for... Uh, extending SmackDown essentially to three and a half hours are probably the people in charge of programming, maybe the people that are doing the research who feel like that real estate right after SmackDown is, you know, the best time to debut a new show on the network. I would hope that once, you know, the show gets more established that they would consider moving it to Wednesday because I think everybody, you know, when the CWC debuted, it was on a Wednesday right before or right after uh, NXT and it really was a perfect time. So, um, I, I, I'd like to think that maybe they would listen to people and push it. However, I mean, I think the only people making a real effort to watch 205 Live live uh, are people that are real hardcore fans or people that have to do pro wrestling podcast reviews like ourselves. So um, it's not like everybody has to, you know, they do t- try to tell people to, to, to push them onto the network right afterwards. But I get the feeling a lot of wrestling fans, if they are curious, they'll watch, um, you know, maybe a day later or, or later on during the week. Yeah. And 
it, there was an interesting note because every week in the Observer, Dave has the listings of the most viewed programs on the network. And looking at last week's, one result of this 205 Live at 10 o'clock is that it looks like Talking Smack has actually gone down. Like less people are watching Talking Smack now. And that to me, that's a really important show because it, while it doesn't have the viewership of SmackDown, it does quite, it achieves a lot. To me, it achieves a lot more than 205 Live does in terms of my priorities if I am running this company. And I would want people in the habit of, if they are going to watch anything after SmackDown, putting Talking Smack in that 10 o'clock slot is more advantageous to you. Yeah, yeah, perhaps. So let us get into SmackDown here from Tuesday night. In Chicago, Illinois, it was their second straight night in the arena. They did not sell out Raw on Monday night. On the broadcast here, they stated they did uh, sell out on Tuesday night. And the answer to the big question way, there was no Christmas set. It's done. Mm. It's been put in the WWE warehouse for another year. I'm sorry. Sorry to, to, to hear that. Well, John Cena came out to start the show. Big, uh... John Cena sucks, as the crowd sang. He says it's been too long, and he is at the top of the ramp with his towel. And this is where he says it's been too long. And then he compliments, that's a nice steady cam before he runs down the ramp into the ring. Yeah, uh, I'm sure it was. Yeah. So, and I guess that's quite the compliment given probably some of the steady cams he's seen over the last couple of months. Yes, yes. I'm sure um, there's a compilation out there on YouTube of somebody <laughs> high editing together a bunch of clips of just Cena um, saying things before he walks down the ramp. If they haven't, they will now. Yeah. Because he always says something just stupid at the top. Mm -hmm. Cena says that he missed this as they cheer and they boo. And then the crowd starts chanting CM Punk and... Cena's pretending, or maybe actually couldn't hear them. He's asking, are you chanting Cena sucks? And he says that he thought being in Chicago, instead they'd be chanting go Cubs go. And this was not a 100% pro Cubs crowd because there were a ton of boos for this. And then he asked if there was any White Sox fans in the house. And there seemed to be a lot of White Sox fans in the house. But then they started chanting go Cubs go. So this was... A, it's very tough to do the hometown pop when you're in a city with multiple baseball teams or any multiple franchises in one particular league. Mm -hmm. Quite the divide here in Chicago. But uh, much like Stephanie, I'm sure Cena came out with his ammunition in case there were going to be punk chants. And his go-to was, well, the Chicago Cubs just won the World Series. Easy. Cena then runs through all the title matches that are coming up on tonight's show. All the participants... Uh, in the main event, they boo Ziggler, they boo Corbin, but then they cheer AJ Styles, and he puts over AJ. And then he's asked, well, what am I doing here tonight? And this led to an Undertaker chant that Cena certainly didn't try to uh, just continue his promo. He let this chant like just kind of simmer and then grow. And that was not the direction at all that things were going. It was almost like he built up to the – it was very much like Stephanie's tease of the reunion with the Shield. And then, now I'm going to challenge the winner of the title match tonight. And then and then we moved on from the Undertaker chant. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I, I get the sense that he just kind of likes letting the crowd dictate, you know, um, whatever they want to. And who knows? Maybe the Taker program is is not going to be for the Rumble. It could be for a show after that, though. Possible. He says 2016 was not a super year for him. He's been told that he's damaged goods. People think he's a part-timer. He's got one foot out the door, but he is here to set the record straight. He is not done. He's not leaving. And he is sick of this new era BS. It's the my time is now era. And says, after a year like this, you get up. You fire up and you kick ass. And he's going to be watching the main event closely so that he can challenge the winner to a title match at the Royal Rumble and says he can do that because he's John Cena. Recognize. 
Yeah, I thought he managed to keep control of the segment, you know, despite how how loud the the crowd was. I I I actually wasn't totally expecting him to get booed uh, because this being his return and everything. So that kind of surprised me. And I, I I do wonder. I mean, is this crowd does this crowd simply really not want to see the guy? Would they prefer if he wasn't on the show, or are they no. are they just conditioned to to boo him? You know. Um, but I thought Cena did a very good job, laid out all his cues. He essentially played the host of uh, tonight's show, and he did a good job of it. Warmed up this crowd, set up his own story. Yeah, yeah this was his opening monologue. Mm-hmm. All this needed was to plug the musical guest for later on in the show and said, we have a great show coming up. Mm-hmm. Uh, this was also, I mean, it was very funny that here we had, you know, the, the crowd that did boo this guy. I mean, we had pretty much a full arena here. And then at the end of SmackDown, they announced that John Cena would be having a dark match. They were they announced a tag match for after 205 Live. And therefore, this entire audience stayed for 205 Live. Mm -hmm. Like it looked full for 205 Live. So uh, John Cena was clearly uh, the reason for uh, the success of this show at least as a live event. And I think the number, I think there's a chance this could top the raw number. The raw number isn't out yet because of the holidays, but I'm very curious to see how SmackDown does in comparison this week. So then there was security in front of the Miz's dressing room. Dasha knocks on the door. Maurice answers. Miz comes to the door, but he will only answer questions from the unprofessional journalist that slapped him last week, Renee Young. And then we go to the fatal four-way for the tag titles. It's Randy Orton and Luke Harper. Unlike the New Day, there was no explanation for this one way about the psychology of using Luke Harper instead of Bray Wyatt, although it can feed a storyline uh, furthering with the finish of this match. Mm-hmm. But no explanation at the beginning. Uh, Rhino and Heath Slater, American Alpha, and then the Usos for the tag titles. Uh, this was the makeshift match after Zack Ryder got hurt. And theoretically, that would have been the tag match on this show had he not been hurt. Morrow then says that they are sold out tonight, and JBL notes that they outdrew Raw, and they are the real A-show. Big shots being fired way mm-hmm. over Chicago. Slater is in. He fired up. He kicked Jay off the apron, and then he slips coming off the top turnbuckle and gets hit with a super kick from Jimmy, and Heath Slater is eliminated as him and Rhino go to the back. They come back from break. Gable gets a hot tag from Jordan. He's in with Jay. The Usos come off the top and both get hit with overhead belly-to-belly suplexes. And then Gable gets a sunset flip and pins Jay to eliminate the Usos. Jimmy then pulls Jordan off the apron. They attack American Alpha on the floor before leaving. And the crowd was so into Randy Orton here. They were chanting RKO. He was one of the biggest baby faces on this show. Agreed. Orton, Yeah. Orton was in with Jordan and... I don't know if you saw enough of them, but I would really like to see a singles match with Orton and either Jordan or Gable. But I thought I thought Orton and Jordan, first of all, it's a fresh pairing. And I think these two could have a great television match at some point, which they probably will. Yeah, at some point. Um, I, I, they could do that. They could do that if they lead up to a rematch. But for now, uh, you would have to really kind of warm both guys up and to, to do a singles match, I feel. Gable hit this awesome bridging German to Luke Harper, which just looked amazing given the, the size disparity. Orton then attacked Gable as Bray is distracting the referee, and then Harper catapults Gable throat first into the bottom rope, and they have the heat on Gable forever. Eventually, he hits a head scissor, sending Harper into the corner, making the hot tag to Jordan, who hits a suplex to Harper, then a Saito suplex uh, to to Orton, Gable hit this cannonball off the apron to Harper on the floor, and then Orton hits a draping DDT to Gable, and the crowd is all behind Orton here. Orton goes to superplex Gable, but Luke Harper climbs up the turnbuckle at the same time and crashes into Orton, screwing up the superplex. Harper falls down to the floor, and American Alpha recover. Gable hits a missile drop kick, and then they hit the grand amplitude, and Chad Gable pins Randy Orton for what I thought was a pretty big surprise in that they changed the titles and American Alpha are the new tag champs and Randy Orton was the one that got pinned. I thought if you're going to look at this and there were to be a title change, uh, you would assume Luke Harper's taking the pin, but no, it was Orton. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, I thought it was a good match. Surprising finish. They really told no story leading up to the title change. So I, I this felt very. I mean, they even said it on Talking Smack. They kind of alluded to it that this truly came out of nowhere. And I, I get the impression this was nothing that was planned in advance because this wasn't even the match originally. It was just going to be the hype bros. Yeah, yeah. And who knows? Maybe the hype bros would have won the titles too. But I feel like it was probably more done to facilitate the tension between the Wyatts. Um, so. You know. It really felt like they're speeding that program up because they had – I mean they just put the titles on them and they had – I felt a lot still to go and it just seems they're going to accelerate that with something – maybe all three are in the Rumble. I don't know what it is. The problem but. is – I mean who who would they have feuded with in this tag division? You know, Outside of dropping it to Alpha, who are the other real contenders that could have taken the belt off of them? So um, now that Alpha ha- have the titles – I guess you could do a rematch with the Wyatts if they wanted to. Well, I, I think with the contenders, like what you were saying about no contenders, I think it ultimately could have been American Alpha, but they were very cold coming into this match. This was not built to. This was not – there was nothing. It was just they won the titles out of nowhere. They've hardly been on television. Yeah, yeah. So it tells me that um, it could have been anybody, but uh, the American Alpha were probably the best choice, and I think – um, now they can feud with some of the other tag teams um, and hopefully uh, get a bit more established with the titles like they've, they've done with a lot of other teams. So did you watch Talking Smack? Yeah. I'm going to jump around here. Yeah. Okay. Were you as puzzled as I was that Jordan and Gable had their families in the front row, including Gable's one-year-old daughter? Their parents were there. They're all hugging them after the match, and none of this was acknowledged. None of this was acknowledged on the broadcast. Right. How easy would that have been? I mean, they're showing all this great footage on Talking Smack. It's like these guys are – their family is right there. I mean, let's give them something here for this title celebration, but instead it was just the uh, Orton and Harper exchanging words as Bray got in between them, and then – if you tuned in to Talking Smack, you you would realize this is probably quite the emotional day for these two guys. Yeah, I, I didn't even – are they close to their hometown or something? Like They're both from uh, around there, okay. I believe. Yeah, yeah, no, you wouldn't have known. So um, I'm guessing, you know, again, it, it suggests that they're kind of the side story. And really the, the main story coming out of this is, um, you know, Luke Harper kind of screwing up and costing the, the Wyatts the championship. Renee then interviews Ziggler in the back. He says he gave Corbin a fight last week and that opportunity has constantly slipped past him and he stays up at night questioning when it's going to happen for him and says he's the wild card in this deck tonight on the wild card finals and says the wild card gets you excited, but then you fold. (laughs) But every once in a while, the wild card changes the whole game. And we would learn later tonight, the wild card would prompt you to fold. Dasha interviews James Ellsworth, who was booed. He was never brought in front of the live crowd tonight, and he has asked. <laughs> the question was great. It was, does it ever get you down when people make fun of you? <laughs> and he admits, well, I am pretty scrawny, and I don't have a chin. And yeah, it does bring me down a little. And then Carmella walks in and says that Dasha is, in fact, making fun of him by her line of questioning and says that James is uniquely attractive, and she leaves with James. Mm-hmm. So maybe we're going to find out they they spent New Year's Eve together. Sure. Yeah, I guess. Wow. Talk about a storyline that has us uh, firmly at the back of our seat. Yeah. Um, it's, it's something you can do with Ellsworth that's out of the main event scene. And I guess it's a promotion of sorts for um, Carmella. You know, I guess doing something like this is is – a bigger opportunity than anything she would have in the tag, uh, women's division. Yeah, I guess if if Nikki and Natalia is going to be that feud, mm-hmm. Carmella is kind of odd person out now with Natalia kind of taking her spot to feud with Nikki. Uh, speaking of the women, the women's title match was next. Alexa Bliss against Becky Lynch. And now JBL is clarifying his statement from earlier. He says, <laughs> this was great. 
Raw was sold out too on Monday, but we just had a few more people tonight and says that SmackDown Live is the best show in the world. Hmm. So now, under his definition, both sold out, but we fit more people in. Hmm. Okay. Not not exactly uh, quite the insult at that at that point, but nevertheless, I enjoyed JBL kind of reeling in his insult from earlier. There were a series of pin attempts by both. Becky then bridges out from under Alexa and then goes for an arm bar, and Bliss blocks this by clasping her hands, and there was a good transition here between the two. Bliss standing on her on her back. Becky went for this baseball slide and slid very awkwardly as Bliss then pulled her to the floor and then shoved Becky into the post. They went through the break. Becky came back with these clotheslines that just looked terrible, and then she grabs the rope to block a DDT and snaps Alexa's arm like Pentagon Jr. does and then hit a missile drop kick when all of a sudden music plays and La Luchadora runs down, distracts Becky, and this leads to a roll-up near fall by Alexa. Then Alexa lands his right forearm and does the double knees to Becky, where then she goes for that moonsault to hit the double knees to the body again. This time, the knees did not even connect on the moonsault. Then the twisted bliss onto the knees of Becky. She goes for the disarmer, and bliss has her foot on the rope, and her arm looks – she gets up, and her arm appears out of the socket like she's Tim Sylvia uh, after that Frank Mir fight in 2004. Her arm just looks completely out of place. This must be some crazy thing she can do with her arm because the referee is checking on her arm, and La Luchadora runs Becky into the post, and then Alexa DDTs her and pins Becky Lynch and – all everybody was focusing on was how the fuck does Alexa do that with her arm? Yeah, she's got to be like just some type of double jointed or I don't know. Maybe her arm just looks like that whenever she extends it all the way out. But she was a gymnast, right? I believe so. Yes. So yeah, maybe maybe she suffered an injury and she and this is now her special trick that she has that she's been saving. Could be whatever it was. I feel like. Um, a lot of people were talking about that coming out of this, so I feel like they could have almost used that secret as a you know a bigger angle. Uh, actually, have her sell the arm like that for an extended period of time, leading to a match. But um, it was done for just a smaller spot here, um, but it looked effective. Yeah. Do you know how great that would have been if they showed her arm like that and just? wave the match off and everyone sees this horrifying looking arm and Alexa instead of doing that fake injury a few weeks ago this was the fake injury where it can pay off in a few weeks where her arm clearly looks contorted and then suddenly she just snaps it back and sucker punches Becky Do you know what a great reveal that would be it would be pretty it would good, be a yeah. fake injury that you could totally buy and it and Daniel Bryan, it would not make your GM look stupid for buying it because all of us would too, knowing that she can move her arm like this. Yeah, 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 it, would, it could work. Um, so then you just explain that she's double jointed and that's why she was uh, okay. Yeah, well, that's probably going to be the explanation for, for this at some point. Yeah. Anyway, um, that said, um, I thought this match was better than the TLC match, their tables match. I thought Alexa looked good in this. Yeah, I thought it was a good match overall. Uh, there was a recap of Miz and Renee from last week, and then Renee knocks on Miz's door. Maurice answers and looks just pissed at Renee. Miz says he'll handle this, and he sends his security guards away. And Renee just asks Miz a, a nothing question with no emotion. And then... Dean Ambrose appears behind the Miz with a security shirt on and then attacks Miz. Security is called back. Then Dean attacks them. And it ends with him grabbing the walkie talkie over the fallen Miz and stating all clear. Yeah. Was our involvement of Dean Ambrose on this show tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, he was on Talking Smack, but. Yes, he was on Talking Smack. Much more time on Talking Smack than he was on SmackDown. Uh, but next week, there is going to be an intercontinental title match between The Miz and Dean a Ambrose in Jacksonville. Dasha then interviews Nikki in the locker room and asks about how Natalia has been a friend for almost a decade. 
And Nikki defends herself, stating she worked her tail off to become Divas champion. She returned in 10 months, not because of her looks. And she's proud to be part of two reality shows. And she is madly in love with the man of her dreams. And she will speak to Natalia face to face, I guess, at a time to be determined. All of the uh, relationships that they're trying to uh, incorporate from Total Divas now with Ambrose, with Cena, they all feel like they're just kind of one-sided and they're all coming from the girls instead of, uh, well, I guess in the case of The Miz, it was it, it was more The Miz than Renee, but it felt like, it feels like Dean Ambrose, John Cena never acknowledges the relationship. Uh, Dean Ambrose himself, you know, as you'll hear on Talking Smack, uh, he got, he explains that he got his revenge on The Miz because The Miz attacked him last week, not because uh, The Miz insulted Renee. You know, earlier in the show. So uh, I get the sense that a lot of the guys aren't really on board with making a lot of that <laughs> stuff public. But, you know, it's it's something they're trying to do. Um, uh, Wait till the relationship division starts, Way. Uh, like an intergender relationship division? Yeah. Okay. You can have the championships. Instead of each having their own title, they're going to have half titles that when you put them together, it's a heart. Like a his and hers title? Yeah. Like they did with um, – Lay cool when they broke the Divas title in half. Mm-hmm. They could. That's, and they have to carry the titles together down the ring. Arm in arm, their entrances. Yeah. Then we go to Renee interviewing Baron Corbin, who does not feel the pressure and says that he should have been treated like a top star a long time ago and calls Styles and Ziggler little men who will meet the end of days. Then we go to the main event, three-way match for the WWE title. Styles, Ziggler, and Corbin, the crowd all behind AJ Styles at the start of this. And Styles starts by leg-kicking Corbin. We went through a break, and Corbin is in control. He attacks Ziggler's lower back by running it into the apron. There was a spot where Ziggler drop-kicked Corbin into a crucifix by AJ and then had to make his own save here because he had set up a pin attempt Uh, by AJ Styles. Then Corbin came back. They gave him quite a lot in this match. He hit a double clothesline. He went for the end of days on Ziggler, but Styles blocked it and then got driven into the corner. Styles and Ziggler then were working together, sending him to the floor, and the announce desk gets cleared. Corbin ends up on the announce desk after Ziggler super kicks him, and then Styles and Ziggler come off the barricade with tandem elbow drops to put Corbin through the desk. And then Ziggler... Uh, delivers this urinagi to Styles onto the edge of the apron. The guy that was touch and go last year for his match with Nakamura because of de- a debilitating back injury. This is the greatest endorsement DDP Yoga could ever provide. Is AJ Styles in this past year? Mm-hmm. Uh, there was there was this crazy back body drop that AJ took where he went into orbit in the air, and it didn't even it aired during the commercial break that they showed the highlight of. Then AJ returned, hit a Ushiguroshi to Ziggler. Then he went for the Styles Clash, couldn't hit it, and the phenomenal forearm gets stopped with a super kick as he goes for the springboard. Then Ziggler lands a super kick for a near fall. Corbin comes back, he hits the deep six to Ziggler. And then Styles is lighting up Ziggler with strikes when Corbin goes for the end of days. And upon going for the end of days to Styles, Ziggler hits Corbin with the zigzag. And this crowd was very impressed with the fluidity of these two moves being hit simultaneously. It looked really cool. Yeah. JBL calls this a career defining performance for Corbin. And it ends with Ziggler on the turnbuckle, getting crotched by Corbin, who then hits the end of days to Ziggler. And then AJ hits the phenomenal forearm to take Corbin out of the match. And AJ covers Ziggler and retains the title. Really strong main event. I felt I did too. I thought they put Corbin over really strong and, um, to end the show with AJ coming out on top, JBL was making a real effort to kind of cement uh, Styles as the MVP of 2016, which I think a lot of people could agree with. So after the match, John Cena runs out. He offers his hand. As the fans are booing this, they do not want to see AJ Styles shake his hand. And Styles is reluctant, but then he does and grabs the title and says the title isn't going anywhere. And then we ended the show with Neville, who says lately he's felt like the man the WWE Universe forgot. He says his inferior competition will have no choice but to respect him as the king of the cruiserweights. 
And that is how SmackDown concluded. I thought a pretty strong episode of SmackDown. Only three matches, but they were all promoted in advance. Everything on this show felt of importance. There didn't feel to be any throwaway segments on this show. Yeah, yeah, I thought so. I I enjoyed SmackDown. Talking Smack this week featured Renee Young and JBL filling in for Daniel Bryan. How did you enjoy JBL on this show? I thought he was pretty good. Uh, and you know, if you watch any of the JBL interview shows on the network, you kind of get the same vibe here. He's actually a very good interviewer. Um, it's different though. It's a different vibe from Daniel Bryan. Daniel Bryan, when, when Bryan's on with Renee, it feels more like you're listening to like a loose podcast with Mm -hmm. JBL. It feels more like a formal interview, like, um, like a Charlie Rose type of thing, you know, and they're both good. It's just, uh, they're slightly different. So Renee and JBL immediately bonded by making fun of Moro Ronaldo and JBL stating that he blocked him. And Renee says he retweets too much. John Cena is their first guest and he comes out and he extends his hand. And much like AJ Styles, it was left there for quite a while because JBL had his back to Cena. And then Renee tries to cover and she tries to reach to shake his hand And she can't reach that far. So then she has to tap JBL and said, hey, shake his fucking hand. And then JBL realizes that Cena has just been waiting here for a handshake. Yeah, that that gets really awkward. And then we get right into things. And Cena says that the comments he made about The Rock years ago were the stupidest things he ever said. He says that he was stating those comments as a way to convince The Rock to come back and now he's the most successful actor out there and what he's doing is good for all of us and Cena is sick of the gossip and the rumors of there being issues between himself and the WWE and then the WWE title just appears on the desk and AJ Styles walks in and he accuses John Cena of trying to big league him with the handshake earlier on SmackDown and Cena says I wasn't trying to punk you. I'll punk you at the Rumble. And Styles says, yeah, just like SummerSlam, I took your best shot. And Cena laughs. He laughs at the idea that he gave him his best shot, stating, I had a destroyed shoulder all year before SummerSlam. This came off like such a... What a what a bitch response here from John Cena. Covering for his loss. <laughs> Oh, the the match where I had had a shoulder injury all that time during this year? Nah, that was that was nothing at SummerSlam. So Cena says, if I wanted to punk you, I would, and it would be easy. And then AJ just walks off. I've got to say, John Cena came off like such a dick in this exchange with, with AJ Styles. Why is that? Because he... He lost to this guy clean Mm -hmm. at SummerSlam. That was the whole story was he lost clean. So then he just uses this comment about, well, I had a shoulder injury prior to that. And then he says, if I wanted to beat you, I would. And it would be easy. This cocky prick who lost to this guy, lost to him, says it would be easy. Mm. How could you not see this guy is just so arrogant here in this exchange? Yeah, I I feel... And I felt this was just these two playing off each other. Yeah, it was, clearly. And maybe if this was something that was written beforehand, they would have maybe understood, you know, maybe this uh, Cena saying that beating AJ would be easy isn't necessarily the best way for a babyface to speak, uh, coming off of a loss rather than, you know, treating AJ as, as sort of the favorite and Cena treating himself as the underdog facing a, you know, a tough challenge in AJ Styles. Um, but because this was improvised, I get the sense that it was just probably Cena doing his best trash talking. Um, and you know, him saying what he thinks is the best way to get people interested in, in another match between the two of them. This would be like Ronda Rousey telling Holly Holm before their rematch. If I want to beat you, I could, and it would be easy. Yeah. Yeah, it's a little I guess silly. It's dude, this is way different though, you know. Cena wasn't destroyed and like like in the end are you do you think him saying what he said would make people more interested? I I think just the fact that it's two people arguing is enough to uh I guess, you know, draw attention most of the time. 
Well, I thought the big – like, granted, the the whole crux of this feud is that Cena can't beat this guy, which to me would be kind of – his comments kind of took away from that. And the other is the, the, this whole title story that they've been doing forever. And then the very next line when JBL sets him up for this, Cena's like, I don't even care about tying the record. I just want to prove that uh, I'm not done and – I'm not leaving to do films and lots of people in this company film movies like Ambrose and Miz and Orton. It just felt like Cena was just going off the cuff here, but it really didn't uh, to me. uh, It just wasn't succinct with like the build for this rematch. Like all this stuff was set in place, like chasing the, the fictitious title record. He, he lost to AJ Styles in this, you know, clean way at SummerSlam. And he just kind of, I just feel he was just coming off the cuff in this exchange and kind of just buried all that stuff that you've that you've built up. That is the story, the number of stories going into this Royal Rumble match. Right. Well, I think that's what talking smack is. You know, it's guys just trying to convey their own interpretations of their storylines, and mm-hmm. that's not always in line with what the company wants them to say. So you'll get instances like this for better or worse. JBL compares. John Cena and his big big match experience to Bruno San Martino. And Cena says he likes being the underdog. He's going to be turning 40 in April, and he's going to defy that people say that you can't compete at this level once you're in your 40s. And uh, that was John Cena on the show. American Alpha were next, and this is where they stated that that just came out of nowhere, winning the tag titles. And JBL is bringing up all the people they had in attendance and how many tickets they gave out. And Jordan was explaining that it was his mom and his dad and his niece in the front row and that Gable's family was also there, including his daughter, who just turned one. And this this footage looked incredible. I was like, if this had just been pointed out on the broadcast, I think this would have been, you know, this was a very out of nowhere title change that this was easy. This was so easy to have just been aware of on the actual show. And then this was awesome. JBL is praising these guys, but then he just says, can you guys just dump the ready, willing, and Gable stuff? It's awful. You guys are like the Briscoes or the Steiners. These towels are terrible. (laughs) And he just rants on this, and it it culminates with the end of the interview where Gable just tells JBL, okay, it's done. (laughs) This had clearly been building in JBL. He just hated these fucking towels and this stupid – catchphrase ready willing and gable and that's it they said it's done i I don't really disagree with them i feel like it's sort of a i don't know it's sort of a one-dimensional catchphrase that um they could throw out occasionally but i feel like they've been relying on a little too much in their promos so i don't completely disagree with jbl so then we move on jbl he's talking about the origins of the superplex from scott Irwin. then he's discussing dano o'mahoney a name I never thought I'd hear on Talking Smack. And then the final guest was Dean Ambrose, who's still in his security shirt and is asking if he looks good in these collared shirts. And Renee suggests that he wears suits. And then JBL, thinking that it's just uh, he's just going to have some fun here, suggests that Dean get a makeover and not look like someone that climbed out of a dumpster. And Dean gets very put off by this. This this felt like um, this felt like Steve Austin and. Dean Ambrose <laughs> chemistry. He says, I'm really offended by the fact that you're, you're just making fun of me like this. I will smack you here in front of everybody. And then JBL brings up Renee slapping Miz, and he wants to know Dean's thoughts on this. And Dean says, well, she can do whatever she wants. She used to be a hockey enforcer and compares her to Ty Domi, another name I didn't think I'd ever hear on Talking Smack. Number 28 himself. Mm-hmm. I thought uh, JBL was great here. He's then grilling them if this is a conflict of interest that they're dating. And Renee is a reporter who has to cover her boyfriend. And Dean just says, what is this? And he just goes off into one of his Dean Ambrose stories about not wanting to upset women and learning this at a young age when he stole a popsicle from his grandmother who then stuck the dog on Dean as a child. And he learned from then on, you don't upset women. Dean then had a message for the children out there about lessons, and he stared into the camera. Unfortunately, it was the wrong camera, so we just got a side profile of Dean. 
instructing the children. And then it ends with Ambrose stating he will maim the Miz. He will crush his veneers and says that Miz is quietly putting together a Hall of Fame career. And he will get to knock him off next week. It's so quite the talking smack. I felt it was uh, a multi-layered show. But I got to say I liked it. I, I thought I thought Dean sucked. I, I hate him on these types <laughs> of shows. Um, I think he just gets into these rambly states and um, – Get you know getting into, it felt like it, fe- it felt like he and and uh, JBL uh, I mean uh, uh, JBL kind of put Dean in a position where he, Dean had to stand up for himself and it gets into that weird space where like the care you expect the character of Dean Ambrose to just like go off on a guy like JBL but because of this kind of loose backstage nature it feels like the uh like the actor behind Dean Ambrose still has to maintain a level of respect for for JBL. So um, it, 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 it just it, – it's not completely congruent. I, I do like JBL kind of like grilling the two of them about you know the, the conflict of interest. I think that that whole relationship hasn't really had enough um, I guess mm, sh- showcase. This is, like, this is like the West Wing with CJ and Danny. I'd never watch that show. But uh, but yeah, like I I thought JVL was nice to have there between the two of them talking. Uh, but I I, I get the sense Ambrose, oh, man, I just don't like him on these shows. He just I thought he stayed on for a little too long. Um, it felt like he was trying to bring things. It just wasn't smooth. Uh, and you know who yeah. Dean Ambrose is on this show, and this is why I kind of enjoy him. He is Nathan for you. Mm. He's he's so awkward here, and I enjoy the awkwardness that this guy brings because every segment with Dean Ambrose, it's I've got to be different. I've got to be true to this Dean Ambrose character in all these wacky WWE scenarios I'm put in. And I think at the crux here, he came on to really just push this match with The Miz, but you go into all of these weird non sequiturs and – on top of it, like the Dean Ambrose character would never have a girlfriend. It's so awkward yeah, for this character. Like this character is just not someone you would ever imagine having a girlfriend, much less Renee Young yeah. as his girlfriend. He definitely seemed a little bit uncomfortable. And like, you know, like like he said, he got revenge not because uh, The Miz insulted Renee. He got revenge because The Miz attacked him and only that. So he seems to be a little uncomfortable, I would say, you know, watching to to fully acknowledge it. I I, I wonder I have to wonder how exactly how much um, how much direction he's been given, you know, in in, in terms of how much he he is supposed to acknowledge this whole Renee relationship, too. I I, I can't imagine everybody backstage being on board with the Dean Ambrose character or the John Cena characters. Um, acknowledging that they have girlfriends on, on their TV shows. I've got to say, though, I I so enjoy talking smack every week. Like one day, I I just I want to write the 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 oral history of talking smack. I just want to get behind the scenes of this show, and it's the most fascinating WWE show they produce every week. Is it your show of the year? Tune in Sunday night, and we will find out. If it is John Pollock's show of the year, maybe way we're going to have to grill you on some of these because you, uh, you kind of, uh, part timed us. You were, you kind of John Cena at us this year. No, I just hate uh, doing these best of lists. I, I really, I'm not good at them and whatever I say mm, won't be, nah, it's just, you, you carry a lot of weight in this industry way. Um, Okay. Did you watch 205 Live? Yes. All right. It started with Morrow reeling, reeling from this main event on SmackDown. He clearly loved that three-way match to the point that Graves said that he better not have a heart attack here. And then we had Cedric Alexander against Tony Nese. Cedric is with Alicia Fox, and Tony Nese is with the woman hater, Drew Gulak. (laughs) And... (laughs) That's all we know about Drew Gulak on this show. Uh, nice shoved Alexander off the turnbuckle to the floor. Nice swept Alexander, applied a body scissors, and then there was a handspring into a kick by Alexander, springboard clothesline, and then Fox and Gulak start arguing on the floor 
uh, presumably because Alicia is a woman. And <laughs> in yelling, Alicia did like her crazy acting like she did with Nia Jax that one time backstage and her boot falls off as Gulak falls to the floor from Alicia's yelling. And Fox gets ejected by the referee for this, for yelling, for yelling. She was causing a distraction, yeah. Could you imagine Jimmy Hart in this era? Wow, true. He, co- he couldn't manage. Alexander then uh, turns around from all this and is hit with a palm strike by Tony Nese, who wins the match in six minutes and two seconds. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, the match was, was okay. Just a match. It was more uh, centered around the the seconds yeah. on the floor. The the um the Alicia Fox thing. I I mean I understand why they chose her for this because you know she probably has nothing else going on. But uh, it's hard to kind of see why anybody would be attracted to Alicia Fox. But not not physically, of course. She's gorgeous, but uh, because you've been promoting her as this crazy woman, you know, you've been promoting the character as you know. This this heel who just freaks out and to kind of now treat her as sort of like the object of it of like a bunch of people's desires, it, it essentially baby faces her. But it 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 it's just it's hard to buy. You know, it's hard to buy why Noam Dar or uh, Cedric would be into her uh, unless you had some explanation that they like crazy girls or something. So Fox is backstage and Noam Dar appears and he got her a Christmas present and has mistletoe that he he holds above them. And Fox slaps him. He smiles and then tries it again and gets slapped the second time. And she just leaves as Noam says, Merry Christmas to me. And this dude is totally going to come out of this as a baby face. I think he is the one personality that has really come through on this show of all these wacky gimmicks we've talked about. His is not all that wacky. He's just loves women and he's very he's a shadow masochist <laughs> is what he is. Yes. He likes getting hit by women. So you have so, Drew Gulak who just doesn't want women in wrestling in general. And I guess you have no Dar who, who does, who does. Um, I, uh, I feel like we're all we're just kind of getting glimpses, and I feel like the performers themselves are probably still trying to figure out what exactly these char- new characters are that they're playing. Oh, we're we're gonna get one a drastic one eighty from his prior opinion of the uh, the audience. What that's still to come uh, in oh. Mustafa Ali. Yeah, but uh, uh, it it it's you can kind of sense that it's a learning experience for all of these guys too, who I I would assume on the in, independence are really not used to playing these types of sports entertainment characters. So um, it's an interesting experiment to watch a Drew Gulak try to uh, learn to be a misogynist on TV every single week. In some ways, it's it's the most intriguing part of 205 Live. It's just, uh, yeah, I mean, you take these great wrestlers who are hired because they're great wrestlers, and now we give them ridiculous gimmicks, and we try to see them act their way out of it. It's like we're watching SNL characters and we're seeing, well, which characters will be brought back or not? Like, which which personalities are going to take off and which ones are we just going to drop cold turkey? Like, Tony Nese, he's, he had no reference to the promo the last time he was on about complaining about the ring conditions and all of that. So, I mean, he was just a guy here on this show. Yeah, it's no bizarre. personality. It's really bizarre. I would love to see a talking smack with these guys. I think I feel like guys like these would would benefit greatly from you know a forum like that where they could kind of improvise and flesh out their own interpretations of their own characters. It would also give some fresh guests on talking smack because you watch that show and it really shines a light right. on just this is a small roster. Like you're getting everybody in pretty quick rotation coming back on this. But show. But they're technically different brands, and also you know logistically they tape at the same time. So yeah. It is, really it is tough to do that. Renee then does a sit-down interview with Neville. I thought, okay, these sit-downs that Michael Cole would do are usually pretty good. This just – the visual of this was ridiculous. Neville walks in in his wrestling trunks, and that's it, and sits down in this sit-down environment, and he just looked ridiculous here with his, with shirtless and in his trunk – in his underwear, essentially, for this interview with Renee. And he is upset that he was overlooked by the WWE to launch this division, and it was done because he was too good. One, one second. Have you seen Neville 
when he's not dressed for wrestling? Like, have you seen him on Swerved or like any of these other shows? No. Uh, the dude looks even weirder. You know, <laughs> like he's he's got his hair like when it's when he's not out there like looking like he's a wrestler. He's got these terrible glasses. He's got his hair uh, tied back in a ponytail, so his ears pop right out. He's usually wearing like a polo shirt. Trust me, well, he looks way well, better. That, he looks way but better. But that fits his that fits his new character now because he's uh, he's supposed to be ugly. That's what he explained on Raw. Everyone thinks he doesn't have a face for Raw. Well, I suppose like, but different differences. He's ugly, but he induces fear at that right now. If you were to look at the guy. Um, like he's usually dressed. I don't know if many people would be afraid of him. Well, when when he he Renee introduces him and he walks into to sit down and it's like this over the shoulder of Neville as he's sitting down and like I just thought of like a Daily Show parody interview. Like here comes the nudist to talk to Samantha B or something. It just looks so <laughs> silly, and I couldn't take any of this seriously. Mm. Uh, he talked about how he would have won the CWC. He calls it discrimination, and he's been discriminated by people ever since he's come to America and will use their cruelty as motivation, but also added that he doesn't believe the WWE discriminates. So let's oh, get that yeah. line in there. Of course not. We don't want fuel for that lawsuit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and he also explained that uh, Rich Swan was his young boy in Japan He's used to fighting 300-pound guys, and he calls this division a dawdle, which Renee doesn't understand the term, and he just ends the interview because of her, I guess, Canadian ignorance and dawdle, a very easy task. What does that mean? A very easy task. Oh. He calls this division. Did you know what that meant? No, I had to look it up, of course. (laughs) But I spelt it correctly on the first try. Right. Yeah, so I (laughs) – so is that – that's part of the character too is <laughs> – he's um... – I, I don't feel we should talk about this because I think of <laughs> all parts of the world, the UK get on us the most when we talk about anything that happens there. No, it's a British audio wrestling um, task to yeah, explain we'll, what we'll, Doddle we'll, means. Yeah, that's what we should call the show. Uh, anyway, I, I, I thought Neville – Doddle the po- – downloading the show is a Doddle. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Um. The show is starting to become a dawdle. What's the opposite of dawdle? Someone tweet me that. That's actually something mm, I want to know. Right. Okay. It's, yeah. I thought Neville was great here. I, I, I think um, he, he's dug into a new side of his personality that I think I think a lot of people haven't been able to see. The guy's been on the roster for, what, two two years now and never really been given a, a chance to speak at length. And you could tell the guy was hungry for it because he's taking full advantage of it right now. He did a great job here in this kind of um, – in this pre-taped environment – uh, told his history with, with Rich Swan really well. Uh, one that I, I wish they would have invested more time in with the announcers, with uh, perhaps even you know uh, videos, pre pre-made packages to tell their story because this is really kind of the only insight you have into the history between these two, which you know is seems like a very rich history. No, I, I think Neville's been very good. Yeah. I think he's exceeded everyone's expectations. If you were to say, Neville, we're going to turn him heel, like that just sounded like what a what an awkward fit for this guy who just seems like a baby face. But he has certainly uh, risen to the occasion with this character. Mustafa Ali against John Yurnit, who you may know as Mr. 450 uh, in WWC, wrestles in Puerto Rico, uh, and has been on NXT in the past. And this match w- just kind of fell apart because Yurnit was running the ropes and injured something. The announcers speculated it could be a groin injury. and It, it, lo- well, it looked like his leg, but I, I've never had a groin injury, well, so it could be similar. Well, it, it looked like it didn't seem to be a knee. It's not like his leg gave out, but it, yeah, it appeared to be like, like the groin. And he's yelling at the referee that he's fine and then gets put in the corner and and Aries is trying to cover for him, saying maybe he's just playing possum. And they just had to go to the finish here, where Ali hit a cutter and then the inverted 450 and pinned him in 207. Uh, so hopefully uh, this is not too serious an injury, but he may have torn something. And he was definitely just trying to gut his way through it, which is something that in today's WWE, 
they are not going to just sit back and not like I'm sure they just wanted this match to get to the finish. Yeah, I'm sure they did too. However, I mean, this poor guy, you know, to to get a a, a spot on 205 Live, you know, a show that he's not uh, supposed to be on. And, you know, getting a, a, I would assume one of the largest audiences he's had, um, and to just immediately go out like that with, with an injury and not getting able to, not being able to showcase anything that you had, uh, must have sucked. So you could feel for him. And I would assume that any wrestler would have done the same thing, tried to cut it out. I guess kind of extra salt in the wound was, Mr. 450 losing to a 450. Yeah, inverted 450, which looks like a great finish. Yes, and we failed to mention, I mean, uh, Ali was billed from Chicago, so he got a big reaction coming out as well. And I I would say of all the crowds, way this one, this was the best that they've had on 205 Live. Yeah, well, by far. Yeah, better than Toronto. Not that there's been much competition, Yeah. yeah. Dasha interviews Ali. Crowd is cheering for him. He says Chicago made him and that people made assumptions on him based on his name and appearance. And he had to prove the universe wrong and says, in fact, all the people proved him wrong. And he's going to let his wins speak for themselves as Mustafa Ali no longer seems to be a guy that feels all Americans are racist. I guess Neville now hates Americans and Mustafa Ali is a baby face. This was the control alt delete on this guy's character. Yeah, he inverted him uh, his character. <laughs> he inverted his four fifty, which Aries calls the zero five four. Mm-hmm. Zero five four. Nice, not bad. Yeah, it, it was a total baby face promo. That finisher was a baby face move, and no explanation. I I'm assu- I don't think they need to because at this point none of these characters are sticking anyway. So the guy could debut a he he could be a construction worker next week, and I don't think anybody would care that much. Yeah, and with a finish like that, probably better. This guy's a baby face. Yeah, and I feel like we need more. Uh, you know, uh, we need more like South Asians that aren't just heels. Well, uh, we still haven't gotten a. Uh... Ho Ho Loon yet? I don't anticipate him uh, outside of like a job match. I don't anticipate him showing. Like he he was introduced with everyone yeah, on that first show. That's true. We haven't had a lot of guys yet. Uh, Arya Davari feature was next. This this was quite the video feature. The first voiceover on this feature to highlight Arya Davari comes courtesy of Corey Graves. And I swear to God, these are the words to introduce this. There's not a whole lot fancy about Arya Davari. That is our opening line of this video feature on this man. And says that uh, Davari is interviewed in this piece stating he's already wrestled on Raw and the Hell in a Cell pay-per-view. And therefore he brings experience to 205 Live. Mm-hmm. And then cites his brother Sean Davari, who he has already outshined and proved he is better and will carry the Davari legacy further, and that the Gallagher loss was simply a fluke. So I almost feel that Sean Davari may be on his way in. No. What? Why else would you? Not to highlight this? live. Maybe he can make two hundred five. I don't know. I don't. This think. totally seemed to be setting up a brother versus brother feud. I thought it was just a throwaway line of of him. You kind of referencing, hey, you might remember my brother. Well, here's a better version. Then we had the duel, the gentleman's duel. And this consisted of a table being set up in the ring with a red carpet. And both men come out and there are weapons to choose from. We've got a frying pan, a rope, a lead pipe, an umbrella, a wrench, and a candlestick, which Gallagher noted was a gift from his friend, Colonel Mustard, which may have gotten, at least from myself, the best reaction on this show. And, of course, the Vince McMahon original, a teapot. Is that a Vince British original? Guy. Why? Well, I'm just saying that when we were talking about the stereotypes for the, the British wrestlers, ah, okay. tea could not be far away as it made its way onto this table. So, Davari 
in understanding the rules, chooses a lead pipe. And Gallagher picks an umbrella, which may have been borrowed from Marty Skrull, for all we know. And they go back to back and go to take five paces, and the duel lasts until someone quits. But Davari tries to sneak attack Gallagher, who catches him and attacks him with the umbrella, sweeps him by the leg, and then Davari drives the table into Gallagher, attacks him with stomps as the crowd chants scoundrel, and then Davari grabs the wrench in the ring and then is stopped by Gallagher. And he headbutts Davari, hits the running drop kick, and Gallagher has announced the winner by forfeit as Davari staggers up the ramp and the announcers state it was the best duel in WWE history. That would be true, yeah. I thought it kind of got over. Uh, I thought the ending was a little bit flat, though. Um, it felt like the beatdown needed to be bigger, or at least, I don't know, this crowd um, didn't necessarily give it the the ovation to end it, and... It's interesting. It's cool that they're trying these different things with the Jack Gallagher. It certainly makes him stand out. And this was okay. Yeah, it was fine. If this crowd really wanted to be innovative and clever, they should have been going, let's go Davari, let's go Gallagher, so that one of the announcers could state that we have dueling chance. <laughs> but Chicago did not partake in that. <laughs> Tajiri is back next week. And then we had our main event, Rich Swan and Neville, which begins, and it is it is explained, this is not a title match. Yeah, I actually I didn't know that. I don't think anyone knew that, mm. because it very much was set up on Raw to be a title match. Yeah. So Neville cuts off Swan, sends him into the barricade, and he did work over the back throughout the match, playing off the angle on Monday. Uh, Neville was in control. The crowd starts chanting for Austin Aries, which Aries was acknowledging but wanting them to pay attention to the match. Neville is in on the turnbuckle. Swan leaps up for a Hurricane Rana, then hit a Phoenix Splash off the second turnbuckle to the floor, hit a Tiger Bomb for a two count, and then Neville sets up for a dive into a super kick, and Swan hits the Fantastic Voyage for a two count, spinning Michinoku Driver. Neville then comes back, drops Swan. He misses his own Phoenix Splash into a head kick by Swan for a two count. And then Swan knocks him off the turnbuckle. He's selling his lower back. And Neville gets up, crotches Swan, and hits a giant superplex for the win at 13.55. No red arrow, just a superplex by Neville. So theoretically, this leads to a title match. It was probably for the best they didn't do a title match because... You don't want to beat Neville. I don't think they wanted to do the title switch so quickly. So, yeah, this probably worked out better, even if it was certainly you were led to believe on Raw. The title match was what was happening tonight. Yes, yes. And I would think that if it wasn't if it was anywhere but the WWE, like if these two were wrestling in Japan, for instance, I don't get the sense that they would do this very typical WWE thing of having a challenger beat the champion in a non-title match to lead to a title match. Um, but because I guess there's so much TV to be done and also because the roster isn't exactly that deep right now, um, they got they have to do things like this. You know, This is kind of the, their way of prolonging feuds. The match was great, and I look forward to the next one because I think Neville in, in the Cruiserweight division is just awesome. He gets to have long matches. The guy gets to play a monster, and he does such a great job of it. To me, like, seeing him wrestle here and to see his aggression and to see the way he was just destroying Swan, like, the guy looks legitimately scary, which, you know, as as a member of the main roster, he never came across as because – mainly because – I mean, simply because of the size and him being a high flyer. But him in, in the cruiserweight division, the guy just – he looks like a beast. So I enjoyed the match a lot. I like Neville here a lot. And I thought the crowd here was about as into it as you could have hoped for given their time slot. Yeah, and it'll be it'll be interesting to see if they continue with this formula of just promoting a John Cena dark match after 205 Live. Because at least for this crowd, they just about all stuck around and they seemed way more livelier for this particular show after sitting through SmackDown. Um, it's also Chicago. John, 
It's also Chicago, so you can't expect this every single week. Yeah. But but don't you, I do I do feel with Cena being back, it helps two hundred five live in a connected. Isn't way. that really silly though to not either not put on AJ or not put on Cena um, on your body on your actual show in order to get people to stay for your web show? Well, I mean, you're you are gonna have Cena. Uh, I mean, there will be times they do both. Like AJ did two matches. Yeah. So. Yeah, it just seems so so weird to me. This whole two hundred five live being on after SmackDown. Well, that to me, I I feel if it was just SmackDown and talking Smack, I thought that's a great two and a half hours. I really enjoyed uh, the combination. Uh, two hundred five live. It was a fine show to me. Good main event. I really think it could benefit from being somewhere else because it's a real marathon, it feels like, on on Tuesday nights to take in all this. But quit complaining about all the wrestling that's out there, Pollock. Tough shit. So that is it. That is uh, our look at the uh, 18-hour Tuesday night of wrestling. And now we'll go through some of your feedback here from the message board. Question from Mark. How would you book Styles and Cena coming out of the Rumble? Is there any chance we get the Cena heel turn leading to a more heated program with Undertaker at Mania rather than the face versus face dynamic? I will say no. Yeah, I don't think so either. I think the face... I I don't really want to see them go in that... Like, Cena is at a level that he's perfect in this role to me. Yeah, I think so. He's not taking... I mean, you could still, you know, use him once in a while to promote a big match like they are for for the Rumble. But uh, I... You know what? I mean, do you see Cena with the title coming out of uh, Rumble? Yeah, possibly. Yeah. I don't know what what, uh, what necessarily your, your direction you go with him right after Mania. I think definitely there's a shot yeah. that he wins the title. Cena, I, I think he kind of has to beat AJ at some point, and it may as well be at the Rumble. Yeah, yeah, and you know, ultimately, I think Cena Taker is a big match, but with the title, um. It could just kind of take it over the top and, and you know, maybe actually be the title program that you, you want to headline a WrestleMania. So, um, but I think a babyface versus babyface dynamic is perfectly fine, especially for a big show like WrestleMania where, you know, you, you're really there. Cena, Cena's going to be booed anyway. It's like, why, why do you have to change anything? If you, if you want to see this guy's like he's going to get booed to, with Taker anyway. To turn Cena heel at this point would likely get him cheered. Um and wouldn't that kind of defeat the purpose anyway? Yeah, it just I don't know. That really doesn't interest me. Okay, we go to uh Larry from East LA who asks if it is Cena Taker at Mania, what do you think should happen with AJ and what's most probable by WWE recent booking standards? Where do you see AJ at WrestleMania? Hmm. Uh, on the SmackDown side of things, uh, he's already done Ambrose. Um, he's already. I mean, Ziggler's no. That's not. I think that's too low. Um, what other baby faces are there on SmackDown? The baby faces on SmackDown are Cena. That you don't uh, don't see that direction. You have, boy, Ambrose not going back to that. Yeah, uh, if he doesn't have the title, I'd I'd love to see maybe an interpromotional match he could have with somebody. <clears throat> um, won't be Shawn Michaels. Uh, yeah, there's nobody else on on SmackDown. I feel that's big enough, and that he hasn't already gone through. He's already wrestled Cena. He's already done Ambrose. Maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe a Roman Reigns. Next to John Cena. Th- think hard about this. Who's the biggest baby face on SmackDown? Dean Ambrose. Or Randy Orton. He's a heel, but, I mean, judging by the, the applause tonight. Honestly, the, the biggest baby face on SmackDown is outside of Cena. I mean, maybe even above Cena is AJ Styles. Mm-hmm. So maybe maybe we, maybe it's a, it's time for a face turn. You know, or Adrian Orton would be awesome. Yeah, Orton did an interview recently. Says he really wants to have a a match with AJ. Mm-hmm. I'm sure they'll get to that at some point. Pastor Doug in Chicago 
Cena just booking himself in the Rumble main event is Hogan level great. Nice to know that it isn't only bad booking decisions, but also bad personal choices in Dolph's life that made him the man he is. Dolph's wild card promo was desperate, and the segment should have been folded. Great call from WWE to point out how generally 2016 has been seen as a shitty year for everyone. And here is the Miz reminding everyone that 2016 was coming up all Miz for the classic heel heat. Man, a lot of questions here about The Undertaker. Everyone guessing what his hmm. involvement will be. There's a definite interest. Uh, and I, I feel like in general, people are, are excited to see a potential Cena Taker match. I think that's a, it's a great matchup for WrestleMania. We got a lay who says, uh, I, I enjoyed the tag match. I'm not mad at the result. American Alpha is the only team that could dethrone the Wyatt. Wait, wait, you, you skipped the first line. Oh, yes. He says, wait, Ting. Hey, w- hey, wait, Ting. You are the reason I listen to the podcast. I just want to thank you. Mm. <laughs> Well, thank you. Uh, 205 Live is getting better with time, in my opinion. Bring Neville adds an established star to the division, especially since the MVP of the CWC didn't sign. And he says that was Kota Ibushi. Ibushi pretty much gave a lot of momentum to Kendrick, TJP, and especially Cedric when he wrestled them. I hope to see my dream match of Ibushi versus Neville one day. They could steal the show at WrestleMania. Talking Smack was great. I was enthusiastic when I saw it was JBL instead of Daniel Bryan, but I liked his interaction with Alpha and the new champs gave the type of interviews you like. Like how an MMA fighter would do an interview. Thank you for the reviews. Sometimes I enjoy your podcast more than the actual shows. Hey, what's the what's the update on uh, Kota Ibushi? I mean, Any? he just doesn't want to sign with them. So he's he's open to taking matches. He's open to coming back for the WWE for for one offs here and there, uh, but just doesn't want to sign a contract. So he'll probably be on the Tokyo Dome show next week for New Japan as as a Tiger Mask W. Do you think that, um, you know, now that we're several months into the Cruiserweight division on in, in the WWE, do you think that the division would be any different had Kota Ibushi or Zack Sabre Jr. signed? Ibushi, yes. I feel he could have been that star babyface to build everything around. I, I think Grand Metalik could be filling in that role. I think he's... How... how but I just don't know how Kota Ibushi would fit into... A batch in the middle of Raw. You know what I mean? And, and I First of all, I wouldn't be putting him in three-minute matches. I would make him this special commodity that the division is all based around. He doesn't wrestle every week, but when he does, it's something spectacular and big. I would have him. To- I wouldn't have him doing backstage skits. Uh, See, these, these would, are things that would change about separate. the division, but I'm saying given what how they're treating the Cruiserweight, division right now well he'd be the one guy i'd isolate from this kind of cookie cutter present presentation for all the cruiserweights you would make him the champion i'd build to it i wouldn't have done it immediately but you could have you could have had him he would have probably been better than perkins in that role as the first champion and and carry it for the first few months i just i just don't know how that would have worked because the way i see it he could have come out here a large part of the audience would know who he was, but I feel like a lot of people wouldn't, you know. And um, to see him come out, not be able, being able to cut promos, having a, you know, a set of commentators who would probably try their best to get him over, but not really. I think I don't necessarily feel like doing, being able to all that well. I just don't see how he would turn out that different from uh, Taka Mishinoku. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, Zach would have had, like, giant teeth and been a live tiger or something. Oh, my God. Could you imagine Zach Saber Jr.? He would have struggled. I really feel he would have struggled in this environment. Yeah, uh, but I feel like he'd be great at uh, at the anti-American thing. <laughs> just comes across as, like... He does come across just... Really cocky yeah, and... Yeah, he, uh, he comes across just like that anyway. Maybe he could do the sit down with Renee, but just not look at her when he she's asking questions. Hmm. He would have a nice jacket, though. Of course. Uh, let's go down to Randy in Melbourne. Uh, this SmackDown was miles better than Raw this week. I don't quite get the booking of putting the belts on American Alpha now, but it was a good match and a cool moment. The main event was a really fun match with good psychology and some great spots. I love the end of day zigzag spot and the style Cena stuff afterwards on Talking Smack was great and makes for a better feud than Owens and Reigns have constructed in two months. The only major negative was the women's match. I really like Alexa and Becky, and they've had good matches before, but trying to do the intricate back-and-forth pin attempts showed a real lack of chemistry. All right, we go to uh, Maniac, 
who says, I once again decided to multitask while watching tonight. This time, like Braun. Like Braun Strowman. Yeah, multitask. This time by packing some old school books away. But SmackDown was miles ahead of last night's Raw, and I couldn't look away from the TV. The crowd even felt hotter, and it was in the same building. Cena coming in and booking his own title match when his when he has done nothing of late to deserve it is something that is frustrating for believability. However, I don't follow MMA closely, but why is Ronda contending for the title this week? That's a fair point. Yes. Exact question, and it's what, what title match are you pining for for the Rumble for AJ without Cena involved? No, there's n- nobody else. I mean, even in the fake rankings of, of the WWE. This is Randy Couture coming out of retirement off a loss. Yeah. And of course, out of respect, he's going to get a heavyweight title fight against Tim Sylvia. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that will be the only comparison of AJ Styles to Tim Sylvia. Although I've mentioned Tim Sylvia twice now on mm-hmm. the show. Zeki. My spirits were lifted when Mustafa Ali got accepted by the Chicago fans, then lifted higher when he cut his babyface promo admitting he was wrong. You can't often say this, but the rest of television can learn a lesson from the story that was told. Kudos to the WWE and the city of Chicago. Aditya from India asks, could Renee cost Dean Ambrose the IC title next week? Oh, I hope not. That would be an awful turn for her terrible or by accident like the like the uh like the uh what is it uh james ellsworth thing oh gosh of course they've already done the ellsworth thing i don't see it happening with renee i also don't see them wanting to get people to boo renee like like i assume would happen Uh, and it makes dean look like an idiot just all these opportunities like he really has to sift through the most shit I feel consistently. I mean, he is for a top guy or a semi top guy. He just seems like he gets throwing lots of stuff. Like when you go back to the, the Wyatt feud stuff and you're going to lose because a, a, mo- a, a hologram or monitor explodes in your face and all the stuff with Ellsworth. And yeah, you go this direction with Renee. Yeah. He's not, he, he, he does get a lot of bad stuff. Yeah. Let's do one more here. PJ from the UK. Excellent show. The only thing I didn't like was the Dolph promo. It's always the same speech. I thought Alexa and Becky had a really good fast-paced match. Alexa was a proper badass popping back in her arm like that. I hope the angle is now that she did it on purpose to distract the referee. Judging by the size and the hair color, I think that La Luchadora will be Mickey James. Hmm. Baron Corbin is getting better and better. JBL was also very good on Talking Smack. Mickey James, do you think? Uh, I mean, it could be – they could reveal it to be anyone. doesn't mean she was the Who one. Who do you think played her tonight? I don't know. I don't even have a guess. Did you hear them exp- uh, guessing on Talking Smack where JBL – originally he was told it was the grandmother of Mil Moskris and then he was – Daughter. Granddaughter? Yeah, that would be – that would make more sense than Mil Moskris is a grandmother. And then said he had heard other rumors. It was Jumbo Senorita. It's a playoff of Jumbo Saruta. Senorita. Maybe it was Rhonda. And, yeah, maybe it was. And her, and she came stating, I will play La Luchadora, but I cannot be interviewed by anybody. <laughs> that should be Miz's gimmick is that he doesn't do media anymore. Well, then how would you? Okay, so he wouldn't be interviewed by Renee. So how would he talk? How would he get over? Uh, he just does. Him? He just speaks with like instead of like Ellen, he can have his own sit down interview once every couple of months. Uh, and he only talks to s- certain outlets because he's such a big star. Hmm. All right. That's going to bring an end to our show. Uh, coming up on Thursday, we've got What's Next with Jason Agnew, Braden Harrington, and Bartender Dave, and they are going to be going through their best and worst of 2016 on NXT, so that should be fun. Then Friday, it is the debut of Keeping It 2000 with Brian Mann and Nate Milton, who will be doing... Sorry, uh, keep, one... keep It 2000. Keep It 2000? Yeah, isn't that what it is? I think it's Keeping. We will find out Shit. on Friday. I already yeah. fucked it up. Yeah, one of us did. Uh, so that's coming no, no, up. No, no, no. It is Keep It 2000. It is Keep It 2000. Yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. Fact checked. So that debuts Friday. Uh, it will be coming out one to two times a month where they are going to go through the year 2000 in WCW, which people are already making bets on how long they last on the message board. Uh, so you can tune into that. And then Sunday night, it is the Law's Best 
of 2016 show. Uh, we are not on TSN until 1 a.m. on Sunday night. Uh, the show will be up at that time to download as well at liveaudiowrestling.com and on iTunes as we go through all major categories uh, with Braden joining Mouth, Agnew, and myself. And then the following week, we're back at 11 p.m. for our worst of 2016 show. So lots of stuff to look forward to. And that is it for us. And we'll speak with you later on this weekend.